Okay, welcome all to Zoom and I uh, appreciate everyone joining um, us today for what I hope will be an extremely meaningful uh, and productive discussion around equity, diversity and inclusion hosted by Storm4. Um, I guess by way of introduction, I'm Ryan Jones, our commercial director here at Storm4. And for those of you who are, aren't familiar with the work that we do, uh, Storm4, a specialist green tech recruitment company, headquartered out of London, but operate predominantly across North America, uh, with offices also covering Europe as well as APAC. Uh, and we're lucky enough to partner with some of the leading innovators within the climate tech space. So uh, please feel free to reach out with me following the event if there's anything you'd like to discuss with either myself or, or the wider Storm4 team. Now onto the event. So as we all know, promoting and delivering EDI in the workplace is an essential aspect of good people management. And to reap the benefits of EDI, it's about creating working environments and cultures where every individual can feel safe, as well as a self um, sense of belonging and is empowered to achieve their full potential. Leaders today understand that diversity is more than just checking boxes and studies have proven that diverse teams drive innovation. They also increase value and also provide and produce smarter business decisions to name just a few. So we're conscious that much is spoken regarding the why this is important, but less is spoken around the how. So today we really wanted to address that. We're joined by our facilitator Padmaja and our two final, I'm sorry, finalists, panelists rather, uh, Hilary and Kylan, who will be talking in depth around the how in each stage of the talent pipeline. And we'll be discussing the strategies and initiatives companies can incorporate in their hiring, onboarding, and also retention phases to ensure that EDI is a foundational component of their scaling businesses. Um, in terms of housekeeping, we'll be in discussion for around 40 minutes before moving on to a 10 to 15 minute Q&A section to round off the conversation. So any questions that crop up uh, throughout the um, discussion, please feel free to just pop those into the chat box and we'll promise to, to cover as many of them off um, during that final section as possible. I'm delighted to now hand over to our facilitator Padmaja for the discussion. So um, yeah, over to you. Thank you, Ryan and Stomfor um, and entire team for this fantastic opportunity. Hey folks, thanks for joining us today to discuss and learn about equity, diversity and inclusion. Let's talk about the why and the how, like Ryan said. My name is Padma Jayagari and my pronouns are she, her and hers. I'm the director of talent management, nextphase.ai. I've spent several years advocating for DNI and was fortunate to bring in initiatives in my current and past roles from developing strategies to navigating implementation and measuring outcomes. I'm excited to introduce to you our extraordinary panels joining me to share their experiences. Hilary Turnipseed, Senior Director Talent, Caper Capital, and Kaelin Akins, Irby, Head of Growth, Planet Forward. Both of them are the force behind their organization in driving the change. Hilary and Kaelin, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Can you please tell us about you, your company, and your journey? Hilary? Yeah, great to be here. Thank you, Stormform, um, for having me. My name is Hillary Turnipseed. As Padmaja mentioned, I am the Senior Director of Talent at Kpor Capital. My role is primarily to support our portfolio companies with all things related to talent and people, but that also includes um, DEI. I am a recruiter by trade, um, but I'm also a glutton for punishment and love working for startups and with startups. And so that means I usually take on the full life cycle of a people process. Um, and I like to say that DEI is usually sort of naturally ingrained in everything that I do. Um, as a recruiter, I often like to take a more sort of strength-based human design approach to sort of identifying and eventually sort of retaining talent and setting new hires up for success throughout their full employment journey. And so I'm really excited to be here to share my learnings, sort of my takeaways, what not to do, um, share my experiences, um, but it's all probably going to come from more of that talent acquisition lens, just because that's sort of my bread and butter. Kylan? Absolutely. So happy to be with everybody and truly amongst friends. So thank you guys for putting this together. My name is Kylan aiken -Zerby. I'm the head of growth at Planet Forward. We're the leading carbon management and climate action platform for consumer companies. So we help everyone in food and beauty and personal care fashion to decarbonize their businesses and get on track to net zero. So super focused on making the change in climate. 
From a journey perspective, uh, I started my career in ESG on the investment side of things. So I was one of the earliest employees for a firm called Malk Partners, which went on to become the leading ESG advisor for uh, private equity. And in that built the ESG strategies for top funds across US and Europe from Vista Equity Partners to Insight Partners to Hellman and Friedman. And as part of that, also their DNI strategies. Um, and so have a lot of experience in that work, both tactically and as an individual that has, you know, either experienced the successes or the failures of DNI programs um, in past roles. And so really. When I joined Planet Forward, it was with a vision of something bigger and better and radical. Uh, Planet Forward was founded by Julia Collins, who is a Black woman and was actually the first Black woman to ever found a unicorn. She's an incredible leader, and that's ultimately what pushed me to join a seed stage company at the idea phase after leaving the investment world was the idea that I could join a leader that I admired and that was going to move through the world championing these ideas, which was extremely important to me as a Black woman, given that that's what I myself want to do as well. And so super excited to dive in today, kind of how we've done that at Planet Forward and, and what that's meant for our business and how it's led its, you know, lent itself to our success. But I think that uh, this work is more than just frameworks and, and, and data points. It's just lived experience for me. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And I do want to add real quick that K4 Capital is a proud investor of Planet Forward. <laughs> They sure are cool. proud investors, <laughs> proud <supporters>. investors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and true partner. So we'll get into some of that, but they, they awesome. move, move beyond the cap table. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have seen Cape or, uh, doing like an, uh, you know, incredible work um, in uh, creating a positive change and also have both what your companies are doing and how they are contributing to the planet and to the entire ecosystem to create like, you know, a sustainable um, uh, uh, community uh, and 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 an ecosystem again, like I said, um, which which not only you know helps us today to live and breathe uh, fresh air, but also for the future generation. So I'm really excited to have you both, um, you know, being my panelist. Uh, so um, as as we all know, over the past few years, we have seen increased efforts and awareness around DNI as many corporates and startups have made commitments. Like Ryan mentioned, the more diverse the companies are, the more profitable they are, the more diverse they are and the more innovative they become. Diversity, equity and inclusion are foundational and critical, uh, cultivating great company culture, environment and has tangible outcomes, business outcomes. Um, I believe and I'm we all believe that it's a representation of people, culture and community. So Hillary, um, can you tell us what does equity, diversity, and inclusion look like in a company for you? Thank you. Um, it's an important question. Um, I, especially from my perspective as a talent leader, um, mm -hmm. building companies from the start is what gets me excited, but it's never too late <laughs> to really focus on this work. So I do want to put that caveat in there. Um, mm -hmm. I firmly believe that people are by far the most important and most valuable asset to any company. And I believe a company's workforce should be absolutely representative of the communities that they are serving. I think in the case of sort of green tech and climate tech, that's everybody, <laughs> which is why I really do try to take that strengths-based sort of human design approach, because I think the more, um, leaders can really adapt into more of a servant leadership model to really get a sense of um, their employees' innate strengths, their human design, instead of trying to put them in a boxes that don't really work, it's really creating more of that two-way approach. I really believe that that is how companies should start defining what diversity looks like within their company and really creating operating philosophies um, and creating values um, that really tie to that. So that way you're really building an environment that's intentional and consciously inclusive that can be scalable and work for different types of design, different types of people, but really um, creating it as sort of a natural operating sort of philosophy in terms of really celebrating people for their strengths and creating different mm -hmm. ways um, 
that employees can really navigate the workforce, whether you're remote or hybrid, the technologies that you use in terms of communicating, how you think about onboarding, even your your interview process, it really should be ingrained in every single step of the employee life cycle process. And I think for a company to maintain that competitive advantage, it really should be a people first sort of environment. And that is um, something that I really am just incredibly grateful to support for an organization like Planet Forward, which is definitely a company. And Kyle, and I will pass it off to you to really talk about what that looks like in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm a strong believer that yes, diverse companies are more valuable for many, many reasons. But as Hillary said, definitely in the climate space. I mean, these are complex issues, oftentimes systemic issues, um, ones that need to be thought about from an intersectional lens. And oftentimes you need different people, different types of people, different backgrounds to be able to acknowledge that and think about solutions extremely critically. So uh, I agree 100%. I'm gonna kind of take it, you know, the E, D and the I in terms of what that means uh, to me and, and in our company. I think from an equity perspective, you know, it's really both forms or, or definitions of the term. It's both equality, but also true equity. So, you know, equality in terms of how people are treated, what opportunities they have within your organization that truly needs to be equal. And then from an equity perspective, it's extremely important that people are valued and that they receive value from the value they create. I think that's just quintessential in terms of long-term retention and making sure that people feel, um, you know, that they're a part of an organization. Uh, from a diversity perspective, that's also all forms, you know, ethnicity, background, thought, uh, I think emphasis on the thought, maybe you have people yeah. that are showing up on paper, checking a box of, you know, yes, I'm of X ethnic background, or I'm a woman, but if everyone came from the same exact background, same school systems, same, you know, investment banking background, whatever it be, you're ending up with people with the same thought patterns. And that's not actually getting you to the point of achieving the value that we could be getting out of diversity. So our team's not only diverse in terms of on paper, you know, backgrounds, ethnically, gender, sexuality, neurodiversity, but we also have diversity in how people think. And we use that mm -hmm. as a true tool for our business. So our entire leadership team and teams do Enneagram tests, which are basically personality tests, which surface different personality types. And it helps us to interact with each other better. If I know that mm -hmm. I'm a seven and I'm an enthusiastic visionary and it's really easy for me to you know see what comes in the future and build towards that but we have other people on the team who are sixes and they're extremely analytic and skeptical and investigative I need to be able to translate ideas into extremely tactical plans for them to be able to grow comfortable with it and they are so extremely important to me to be able to poke holes in that vision as to, hey, here's what's gonna, it's actually gonna take to make that happen. Have you thought about this potential downside? Have you thought about this? Those two different types of thinkers are yeah. extremely complementary to each other. And how could you come up with the most innovative, the most effective, the most well thought through solution without people who are thinking about things from all angles? So uh, I think the thought piece is also just something to really, really emphasize. And then in terms of inclusion, I'm such a champion of radical inclusion and always have been. And that's, you know, thinking critically about how your team spends time together, what you talk about, you know, just hosting happy hours and having ERGs is not really doing the work. You know, did you make those spaces somewhere that people actually left feeling more included or less? I've absolutely gone on team retreats before where I felt more alienated at the end rather than more included. And that's a function of conversations that are happening in those spaces and what was facilitated and what was done. Did we play golf or did we, you know, sit down down and get to know each other. Those are two very different experiences in terms of the outcome, even if they had potentially the same intention. Um, and then also thinking about the fact that ultimately an organization is a function of a bunch of one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so, yes, you can do, you know, high level, uh, you know, organization wide programming and initiatives and culture decks and all that, which we'll talk about, but really it comes down to, are you fostering deep 
and meaningful one-on-one -on -one relationships between teammates and managers and reports, all of those things where ultimately that adds up to the feeling of inclusion is do you feel known? Yeah, um, and I, I absolutely agree with both of you, what you have said and also uh, Hillary, I love the way you said people first and uh, celebrated and also uh, Kaylin, like you mentioned, valued and included, how you include them brings a makes a huge difference. And uh, I've been there in many situations being an immigrant, so <laughs> we can always talk about it. But, uh, you know, from all our experiences, uh, we know that diversity, equity and inclusion is not suffering from lack of attention. But, uh, but, but from the lack of results, um, you know, why do you think there is an uptick and awareness around ED&I, but stagnation when it comes to taking actions uh, or action? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, this work is not for the faint of heart. Um, what we're doing here is we're building new habits and we're breaking bad mm -hmm. ones. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like, oh, I mean, now we're in February. I feel like January was the longest year <laughs> month. But when you think about New Year's resolutions and, you know, it, it's really, it's hard for, cr to build healthy habits and to really have that su substantive change. And so DEI work is the same way where what we're doing is the work is really making those unconscious um, biases conscious to really mm -hmm. impact how, what information we use to make really important decisions like hiring, like salaries, like uh, bu building the, the company, the product direction. And so it, it's, it's a lot of work and it will take time because this change does not happen overnight. Just like we don't wake up one day and lose 10 pounds because we went to the gym that, that one time. And so mm -hmm. I think the other piece though is over the past couple of years, especially in the wake of George Floyd's murder, mm -hmm. we're now really seeing a push for companies to actually focus and co collect data, collect information around employee demographics, regardless of the company stage or size, but also collecting um, data around employee sentiment, how employees are feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to collect this data, but then it's like, okay, well, how do we interpret it? What does this data really mean? What do, what do we do? What's working? What's not? And so I think that's the sort of next phase in this process that a lot of companies are finding themselves in. It's like, we we have the information, but now it's sort of, well, what do we do with it? And what does this mean for our business? Because this isn't a one size fits all approach. And the one example that I like to give around this is, you know, a company can give, um, um, give a survey out and it can say that the company overall is having a strong sense of belonging. They have a strong sense of belonging, but when you look further into, you know, who's filling out the survey, and if you look at the demographic makeup of your organization, and if it's majority white, for instance, it makes sense that maybe there is a strong sense of belonging for the majority. But so mm -hmm. when you look at this data, you have to think of, okay, who is answering this? And how are they answering it? And really making sure that um, business leaders are looking at this data in a more intentional way because the representation piece is that's really hard to really unlock sometimes when um, you do anonymous surveys and whatnot too. And so I think the attention is there. We have to keep the momentum going for sure. But I think it's really about keeping the awareness there, keeping the conscious biases top of mind, but continuing to do the work to really understand, you know, what might be unconscious too. Uh, but yeah, this is not going to be an overnight solution, but, um, but I do think that we're in this next stage of, all right, what does this really mean for us? Got it. Yeah. Kellen, um, would love to hear from you as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the big things here is that people don't recognize that being successful in DEI requires personal change. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm head of growth at Planet Forward. It's my responsibility mm -hmm. to grow revenue with the company and think about our growth strategy and where we're going next and how we get there and, and who we serve. 
you know, there's strategy work that goes into that. There's programs that are put into place. There's metrics that are tracked. But if that's not worked against every single day, that's not going to happen. Numbers are not going to magically change and revenue is not going to magically show up in the door. And so really recognizing that this is ongoing work, but that it requires personal change is really important. And so I think it's pretty obvious why there's been more emphasis on this, right? And I think um, from a personal story perspective, right after George Floyd's murder, I was working in the private equity space and was deeply uncomfortable being on mm -hmm. Zoom calls uh, when there are marches happening outside that I wanted to be a part of and that there are conversations that I think are way more important to be being had in this moment rather than the ones mm -hmm. that we were talking about. And it was quite frankly, my uh, response out of the need for survival for myself to need to start a new service line and a new and a new um, business within our company so that I had an outlet for those feelings. And so mm -hmm. I um, began new diversity initiatives across the PE space. One mm -hmm. of the things that was being done as part of that was diversity trainings for uh, investors and, and management teams in PE. And so I used to do this exercise called the circle of trust. And basically how it works is you name the, the 10 people that are closest to you in your life outside of your family that you trust. And then we start to go through and name different characteristics about those people. Like, where did they go to school? What is their political affiliation? What is their race? What is this? What is that? What is their income background? And by and large, people start to recognize that, you know, 80 plus percent of the, their closest people that they trust have the exact same characteristics of, that, of them. And it was extremely shocking to people, but they also really didn't recognize how they were perpetuating the same issues in their company, in their own lives and in their selves. And that's, you know, the work that needs to be done. It's personal and that's difficult. And that's something that people don't actually think that much about within the context of business and organizations and companies, like personal work that needs to be done. Um, and so... I think to Hillary's point, you know, we have to be actively unrooting and uncovering unbias. And that's one of the places that we really fall short. You know, implementing systems and tracking numbers only works if there's actual power and an emphasis needed to, to do the behaviors um, that are going to change that. And I think one also big mistake that's made is, you know, thinking that just because you hired more people of color, that they're going to then come in and change the culture. That's yep. not fair. Uh, it needs to really change oh. with start with existing leadership. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it puts an undue burden on employees of color to be that agent of change when in reality they should be the ones benefiting from the change occurring that we need. So it really needs to start with leadership and it needs to start with, with personal work translating into consistent implementation of practices, behavior changes um, that are actually going to support the change of those numbers on paper. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, you have uh, really, you know, uh, nailed it on saying that it's it's more about the change and, uh, you know, how, how you can really reduce the gap um, on the non-alignment of how those organizations or leaders um, can think differently and, you know, drive the change. What steps can these organizations can take or think, uh, given your experience, um, you know, from your PA transitioning into a uh, seed stage uh, startup? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think we can kind of talk through the the, the start to finish of all of the things we do, but um, beginning with with hiring, that's. Well, I'll say actually, it really starts before hiring. Uh, you know, it starts with your whoever you have currently on your team thinking about signaling. Uh, so I think that before we're ever talking to people in a context of hiring and bringing them onto our team, we're really trying to set the environment, energy, and clarity about who we are as a company and who we are as individuals and what we value in the people that we're looking to bring onto our team. And we show up and incorporate those principles into everything we do. So you will not read an article about Julia, which doesn't touch on her innovative approach to leadership and leading with joy and leading with inclusivity. And you won't hear me talk about climate without talking about the fact that justice is an extremely important lens to bring to this space. 
and, and, and all the ways that I think you can even just show up by who you are and how you speak and how you interact with people and how you dress all the things that are signals to others that, that this is a safe space for you. Like this company is actually walking the talk and that is the most important foundation before we ever get to the point of hiring because ultimately that's what creates your funnel. That's what draws people to you. That's what makes people want to work for you and want to work hard for you when you get to a point of actually being able to hire. So signaling is, is first and it needs to be authentic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yes. So, and then from there, we're thinking about, you know, how do we expand our funnel outside of ourselves? Our team is um, not only lucky, but also intentionally made up of diverse leaders. Our founder is a woman of color. I am a woman of color. Um, the majority of our leadership team is either people of color and, and we are majority female. And so <clears throat> that's extremely important just in terms of the fact that our own networks are diverse to begin with. And so we're not pulling from, you know, a limited pool of only one type of person. So that's already a strength to begin with. Um, but then we expand ourselves outside of ourselves. We work with partners like Kapor and Mm -hmm. Elemental Accelerator and the Emerson Collective, who all have initiatives internally to be focused on expanding access to diverse candidates in in tech. And so we're also leaning on our partners to be able to tap into all of the hard work that they're doing as well. We've hosted first-gen interns every single summer um, to be able to not only think about the people that we're hiring right away, but also thinking about the people we hire in the future and wanting to make sure they're set up for success. So, it's also a hiring thing for sure, trying to get yourself in front of the right people and making sure that you resonate to them once you're there. And then, um, I mean, should we dive into training resources, all those things, or maybe I'll switch over to Hillary for a second and then we can get into kind of what happens once people are in the door after that. Yeah, I yeah. think the tag team Hillary, a little please. bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I yes to everything that Kylan said and I think because we also work together on the hiring side you know it's very much you know a lot of the process recommendations or stuff that they're already practicing and so it's very much the same stuff but just to kind of highlight just to echo make sure everyone in the audience really understands you know the job description um you know is a really great tool to really control your employer brand narrative and one of the things that makes it really easy to um, support Planet Forward is that their job descriptions are very transparent with the culture, um, the the environment in which um, they operate. Because, you know, as I'm screening candidates, we're very clear, you know, not everyone is for us, but not, you know, but we're not for everyone. And that's totally okay. And so um, interviewing should always be a two-way process in terms of that. And I feel the same way with onboarding too. And we'll get into that later, but the job descriptions are a great way to really hit home of, you know, what is important to you as an organization? What is your mission? What are your values? How do you operate? Because that is who you're talking to. You want to talk to your future team member. And so when you take candidates on that journey where they can really put themselves in it um, and you focus more on the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves or you break that out, what that does is it also makes sure that you're being consciously inclusive in your hiring practices from the gate. You're being clear on what you pay with salary transparency. That's a way to build equity from the start. But also Mm -hmm. um, when you focus on the candidate journey and the the right type of strengths and human design profiles, what it does is it also makes sure you're not preventing folks from applying. Um, Mm -hmm. Because especially if you, I I love the term um, underestimated (laughs) um, to really speak to, um, you know, the actual, like the candidate piece. And when you're often underestimated and you're looking at job requirements, you know, you'll often, you won't apply if you don't meet a hundred percent of that. And so a way that you can really make sure you're being fair, equitable, and inclusive is really starting at the job description and making sure that you're capturing the essence of who you are as a hiring manager and employer, but also making sure, Hey, you're, you're talking to human beings, not just sort of line items that are checking a box, so to speak. And so be intentional with what you put out there as a brand, because if you're not getting 
the candidates that you want, it's probably because of the narrative you're putting out there. So really take that time to really make sure you're putting yourself in the candidate's shoes just as much as the candidates trying to put themselves in the shoes of, hey, do I want to work here? Can I work here? Especially if they're underestimated. Um, the other thing that I just want to highlight, though, is that, you know, not everyone inherently is trained on how to interview. Um, we're usually emulating how we've been interviewed in the past. And most of the time yeah. it's probably not the best experience like ever. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so we're just keeping those bad habits going and going without consciously realizing we are. And so, um, take the time to train or make sure everyone who's involved in the interview process knows what we're look knows what you're looking for, knows the questions to ask, make sure you're not asking the same ones over and over again, but really taking that time to make sure that everyone's on the same page, not only, you know, because you're interviewing to that, you want to hire to that, that's something that is often skipped sometimes in the period of like, we need someone yesterday, taking that time to really getting everyone in a room and being clear on what you're looking for as well is a lot of times um, a, a lot easier of a way to really build that equity and that fairness from the onset. No, no, ab absolutely. And um, I, I really, uh, you know, uh, appreciated how you said that, um, you know, underestimated. And uh, many times I have noticed or I've been in a situation where I have to go and say, start looking at the transferable skills and what they can bring to the table because you're not just hiring for today, you are hiring or you are bringing them for tomorrow and to build the future of this company or this organization. So very much, and you, whatever you said is absolutely true. And like, um, you know, we are, we, are, we are talking about this and uh, I have a follow-up question for both of you. Um, and uh, as we are progressing through the funnel to our onboarding stages, which we have talked about, what steps um, have you taken and what steps um, can the startups take to ensure its onboarding process uh, fosters diversity and inclusion? And how can that be done um, based on your experiences um, and how did you do it? Yeah, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing is back to the equity and the importance of equity is setting up everyone equally for success. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that's really important as Hillary was talking about in terms of interviews is that people are coming in with different backgrounds, different experiences, different previous training, different networks, different signaling from as early on mm -hmm. as your parents, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of how to show up in a workplace and, and what success looks like. And so one of the things that we do, and I mean, this seems extremely baseline, but I think that it's actually one of the most important things is just being extremely comprehensive in training and resources that we provide to people when they come on board. I don't want anyone to start working for us that doesn't feel like they have everything they need to be successful in our organization. And so that means, you know, full access to everything that they need from resources, training, mentorship, books, podcasts, introductions to other advisors in the space to kickstart their own network, putting them into fellowships, whatever it is. Um, we offer those resources to all of our employees because ultimately we're here to say, we hired you because we think that you can kill it in this role. And we wanna make sure that you have everything that you need to do that. And I think that's really step one. First of all, that makes people feel extremely valued. It really mm -hmm. removes a lot of those initial nervousness and anxieties around, you know, how am, am I going to be able to do this? If you feel like yeah. you have everything that you need to. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just kind of, you know, basic competencies that they're going to need. And then there's the part around, you know, is this person feeling completely valued and brought in as a person and as an individual? And so the first step that every employee takes when they come into Planet Forward is to introduce themselves to the whole team. And we encourage them to do so by bringing their full self. So yes, tell us about your background and what you've done before and your accomplishments and yes, but also tell us about your family and your quirks and what you care about and what you do in your free time. And that already sets the stage for authentic relationships to be able to form. Oftentimes when we get you know the full team's replies to a new uh, employee, it's like, I do this too, or this, this, that. And it just gives people a, a kickoff point to start to form relationships outside of only being valued on, on their output or, or their work product. And that's mm -hmm. also really important in remote environments. 
And then bringing them into a culture that already, you know, champions all the things that we're talking about. So, you know, at the top of their onboarding documents is our culture deck. And it is totally on um, each and every person to emulate that and to, and to make it their own. Um, but they also will know that it's a real lived experience at Planet Forward. So we champion our values in the ways that we interact and we show up, we do something called shout outs every other week in our, in our happy half hour where we just shout each other out, make people feel extremely seen for their, for their work, which is extremely important when you have, you know, different levels and layers and teams. And maybe, you know, I'm on the growth team and we see my accomplishments a lot because it's new customers and it's new wins and things like that. But the development team doesn't get to talk about, you know, how hard they worked on a specific feature release, you know? And mm -hmm. so that's a moment for that visibility to be seen across the entire team. We have an appreciation channel on our Slack where we encourage people to tie different things that they're appreciating people to back to our values. And it shows up in the smallest ways, our language. One of our mm -hmm. values at Planet Forward is, um, catalytic creativity, which basically means, uh, you know, we, we have people on our team with wonderful ideas and the purpose is to build on each other and to build each other up in those ideas, not to cut each other down, which is an extremely cultural element. And one of the ways that that shows up is we have a, a yes and rule as opposed to a no but rule. And literally, I can't count how many times I will catch myself saying something I'm like, wait, 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 I actually meant yes and. And it's literally a learning, you know, um, but that's a way that culture shows up literally in our every day. And so we're setting people up for success, but we're also bringing them into a culture that's already established, already practiced, something that they feel like they're becoming a part of, not, it doesn't live on paper, it lives in practice. Um, Just Hillary. Yeah. Um, I want to give another shout out to Enneagram <laughs> as a part of, as a great tool to leverage as a part of your onboarding. Um, I, I'm a nerd for any sort of strengths assessment tool. Um, I've now gone down the human design rabbit hole. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's paid resources. There's also free resources, but I think taking the time to understand your workforce in a more intentional strengths um, based way is, and it's a great team building tool and so team building exercise. But um, if you already have it established as a part of your organization, giving candidates um, or new hires that assessment as a part of onboarding really just allows them to be set up into the fold a lot easier too, because again, it's really practicing that servant leadership model where you're adapting your approach to the person that's in front of you. Um, and so using tools like that and onboarding are really great ways and also avoid making assumptions. Um, but it also allows onboarding like interviewing to be that two-way process. Most companies mm -hmm. take the time and they focus on a candidate or a new hire getting to know the company and how the company operates. But I think it's also an important time for that team and the hiring manager um, to understand this new person that's going to now be a part of the organization too. And so using um, a strengths-based tool is a great way to do it. Um, but there's also um, the personal user manual that, um, that has definitely been used a lot more often than not now, but it's another way um, for new hires to fill that out in the very beginning of their work. And it, you know, and it's a user manual. It's very, it asks questions. How do you prefer to receive feedback? How, you know, how do you best show up? What are, are you a morning person or, or not? And so, and it's a great way to not only um, inform managers of the best way to manage their employees, but it is a powerful self-awareness tool. And I will always tell candidates, you know, uh, you know, it's healthy people <laughs> ask for what they want and what they need. But in order to really do that, you have to have a deep sense of self. And so when you really understand how you best work, what that does is it's not a weakness. It's really how can you best be leveraged for your innate strengths. And if you really have that as a part of your culture at the onset and you're celebrating people for their individuality, because you know, they're going to bring their own secret sauce to the table, regardless, you want to get the most out of that, that person ultimately. And so being able to really unlock those conversations, a very tangible way is using tools like that. So like that was 
the one ad that I want to say to everything that I already echo <laughs> Kylie's doing. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, that's um, absolutely, uh, you know, um, uh, meaningful because so it's like you have to start from the first, from the beginning and, uh, you know, do it like you're doing for the first time so that, you know, you always go back, reflect, check, do the retrospective, make sure that, yeah, you know, the process is aligned and constantly coach, educate, mentor and continue to foster what you are looking forward to do it. Um, and also one thing I would say is like, you know, uh, rather than taking resolutions and commitments, having those goals also helps you to push forward. A small goal is like, you know, uh, like step one, step two and all those kind of things. But uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much and uh, what you both have been doing for your organization. So uh, before, uh, you know, we get into the audience section, I have one final question for both of you and then we'll do a Q&A. Um, so, um, uh, this is something, uh, you know, uh, a study and the research conducted by Harvard Business Review and according to them, inclusion is what unlocks potential in diverse workforce. Therefore, we all arguably uh, say that the most, this is the most important stage of any company's life cycle or journey where it begins. So that being said, what ed &I practices should startups embed into their company culture to ensure Equity, diversity, and inclusion is a foundational component rippled throughout the business. And how should we, I, I wouldn't say how should be done, but what 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 are your thoughts and how, how can they continue to cultivate that? At a very high level, um, and I'm gonna lean on Kylan to dive a little deeper, but I will say that, you know, a way that I've seen in terms of practice of it really being embedded in a company culture is when you're able to tie in your DEI practices to your mission and your values. If you're able to embed that into that foundational component, you know, and then that will then lean into how you operate <laughs> as a business. Mm -hmm. I think if you can really align it to your mission and your values at the start, that's a way for it to just organically work in terms of how you operate as a company. But I do want to say that, you know, regardless of the stage and size, it's never too too early or too late to start this work. And this work does not need to be abandoned, even when like growth is slow or layoffs, we, like even in times of uncertainty, this is not an extracurricular thing. And yeah. so is, and this is everyone's responsibility to really do this work. And at the KPOR Center and our foundation, like we have, we have a certificate program where we talk about even in times of uncertainty, even if you're laying off, there are ways to really do the work in every life cycle of this process. And so I do want to say that it's great if you started from the top and you can do it by tying it to your mission and values for sure, but it's never too late to start. 100%. And <clears throat> I think, you know, to, to connect that to what Hillary's saying in terms of how to operationalize and, and back to what we talked about in the beginning, that like this takes personal work. Um, I believe that the most foundational element is authentic leadership. And that's how this work scales. And the emphasis on the authentic piece, you know, people can see through you if you're not being honest and if you're not being yourself. And as leaders in a company, you set the tone and the expectation for how others are expected to behave. And so, and I say authentic very intentionally in the sense that it's not about signaling that this type of leadership or this type of person is accepted here, wanted and amplified. It's about people showing up as themselves is accepted, wanted and amplified. And that's why you being authentic to who you are as a leader is extremely important because that signals to others that how, who they are is, is, is the right thing, right? Not a specific mold or, or a way to show up. And um, you know, if I show up hyper formal, only talking about work and metrics, and that's how that's how everyone else is going to behave as well, because that's I'm signaling that that's what's valued and that's what's expected, um, and that's not what I want, and so that's not what I'm trying to emulate. And I think that you know, tying that to how does that make your business valuable, that also needs to show up in in like how that 
relates directly to work. So one of my recent hires, um, you know, as we're getting to know each other, asked, what is your leadership style? And I responded, I am outcomes oriented. I, we have very specific and ambitious goals and we're going to get there together, but I recognize that you're coming into this organization with unique skills and strengths. And I'm not going to try to force you into an approach that I prescribe, um, because that would do us both the disservice. That might not be the most efficient way. That might not be the way that amplifies the way that would make you most successful in getting there. And that's not helping me or you. And so I think having an open-mindedness also as to how people can provide value to the company is extremely important. We have, we have our metrics. We know what success looks like. We have specific outcomes to get to, but trying to make there be a cookie cutter way to get there is um, I think a, a trap that a lot of companies fall into and is taking away from the true value that diversity can create. So um, authentic leadership, I cannot emphasize enough and I will champion that till the day I die. <laughs> wow. Lo- love it. Uh, you know, you cannot... That's what it says, right? Bring yourself to work or bring yourself to wherever you go. And then, you know, the ability or the opportunity when given a seat at the table, how do you voice? How do you say? How do you communicate? And how do you make an impact? You don't need to influence it. It's not about, it's, it's not a rat race. It's about how do you impact? How do you make a difference? How do you create a difference? So um, yeah, um, Hillary, anything else you would like to add? Thank you. Thank you both. And it was it was amazing to hear from you both your experiences and your journey and what your company is doing, uh, you know, how how you're, you know, making that change uh, um, towards the planet, people and to the communities you are serving and you are committed for. So really, really appreciate it. Um, So let's let's just go back to our audience and see what questions we have. And uh, they are eager to learn from you, hear from you. Ryan? I, yeah, I am still here. It would not be a Zoom call if I struggled to come off mute. Um, yeah, just echoing what Admarj has just mentioned. Some amazing takeaways there. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you. Um, it's always great to understand what like-minded startups and businesses are implementing. And um, yeah, we'll be certainly stealing a few of those initiatives and, and taking them internally to Storm4 to improve our uh, EDI as, as well. Um, if you don't mind, for a few minutes, we'll go into a couple of questions and I'll put you on the spot uh, with some kind of audience uh, questions just to final uh, finalise everything off. So, yeah, I had some really good questions coming through. So one of them was um, EDI is such a large and important topic and some companies may feel overwhelmed by implementing a strong EDI initiative what would be the best first step for companies that might be feeling like this? Who wants to have a go? Um, I'll, I'll start real quick. Um, it is a lot <laughs> and, um, and it's a marathon, not a sprint, but I'm, I think a good way to recognize, again, this is not a one size fits all approach. And so what is important or what is lacking or the gaps that um, a company is facing is really specific to each company. And so if you have no idea where to start, um, that is where I think getting employee buy-in in terms of what's important um, is a great way to avoid making assumptions and focusing on the wrong thing at first. And so um, surveys, sometimes companies do a lot of it, but I think it's really just how you implement it. But if you're very intentional with the ask and the takeaway, um, it's a great way to really get that buy-in, but also get folks to be involved in the change as well. And so starting with surveying like, hey, you know, if we were to focus on, you know, how would you prioritize these top things? Really starting it from there is a, it's a, it's a great way to not only de-risk, but it also helps de-bias because you're soliciting feedback from the entire a company versus making kind of a very top down or, or isolated decision. And so if you have no idea where to start, it's always good to really focus on what the team at the time thinks is the biggest priority or the biggest blocker and then sort of iterating it from there. Absolutely. And I would just add on that maybe even a step before that so that you can understand like what, what are we being blocked towards, um, get together leadership or working group, or maybe a multi-level group, whatever it is, that's like a, the right 
group to have a, a brainstorming session and lay out your vision, like lay out, you know, the values and the vision for what you want your company to look like, feel like, and be, and then, you know, take that back to the team and get an understanding of where you're at in current state. How far are we actually from that vision and why? And then you can start to think about what the actual strategies need to be to address that. But I think one of the most important things about being able to build buy-in is having a shared vision of where we're trying to get to. And that's a really beautiful place to start. Yeah, uh, I, I, sorry. I echo with both uh, what Hillary and Kellen said. One of the things also when you're, you know, overwhelmed, uh, I, I would encourage you to do an, uh, you know, a quick diversity maturity assessment for your company that tells you like where you are or what, what steps. And that can feed into, you know, the next steps of it and say that, okay, this is where we are and this is where we want to be. And then you can think about the how piece and what can be done. Um, so uh, that's, that's another thing I would add. Brilliant. I'm going to squeeze one more question in and then I'm conscious of time. So um, during the interview process, what questions can be asked to ensure that you're allowing for equity uh, to transition to your hiring process? It's a tricky one. Yeah, I think um, how... I think the questions will definitely depend on who is actually like what stage in the interview process and who it is. But from a recruiter perspective, how I really try to build equity in the process from the start is to make sure that that conversation is always sort of two-sided. I always leave room to talk about the company and the needs and kind of really hone in on sort of that pitch. But in the same breath, a lot of that is me focusing on, all right, well, what's important to you when you're assessing a new opportunity? Um, you know, what environments do you thrive in? Do you need structure? Are you okay with operating in ambiguity? When I ask questions that are more focused around someone's strengths and capabilities, along with kind of, can you do the job? When you ask questions that that give that candidate permission to talk about themselves, but you're not framing it in a negative way. Like, I hate that question. What are your strengths? And then what are your weaknesses? It's saying that something is wrong with you when you can ask, you know, well, what areas would you really want to kind of develop, you know, in this next opportunity? What areas would you like to strengthen? Um, so I think if you really just pivot your language and how you ask the questions to really open up the space to really make it more of a two way conversation versus something pretty rigid, I think that's a way to really kind of help build in that equity kind of at the onset. Kylie, yeah, you know? That makes complete and actually ties into your original point about the interview training element as well and actually ensuring that the people that are interviewing said candidates are actually understanding of how to ask those um, slightly tweaked questions because yeah I don't know how many interviews I've had at, at different businesses that have asked for, for strengths and weaknesses it's kind of like companies may have uh, googled interview questions prior to, uh, to actually doing it rather than actually deeply thinking about that that inclusion piece so um yeah thank you for that Hillary um Perfect. I think that's, um, that's us on time. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for our facilitator, Admarja, um, and both panelists, Hilary and Kylan. Um, such a fantastic discussion and some really key takeaways. Um, so thanks for everyone watching as well, uh, both live and on record, and um, have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.